Well, good morning, and happy Sunday to all, and happy Father's Day to all fathers here this morning. Let's give it up for all the dads in the house this morning, please. And all the dads that are joining us online, too, of course. So, okay, we're going to start off with my day for a miracle. No more worries, no more doubts. Today's my day for a miracle. I'm gonna get up, I dance and shout. Today's my day for a miracle. Today's the day the Lord has made. This is my day. Today's my day for a miracle. Today's my day for a miracle. Accepting only the best for me. Today's my day for a miracle. A living my life a full and free. Today's my day for a miracle. Today's the day the Lord has made. This is my day. The day's my day for a miracle. The day's my day for a miracle. I live each day free of stress and strife. The day's my day for a miracle. Creating joy that comes in my life. The day's my day for a miracle. The day's the day. The Lord has made. This is my day. The day's my day for a miracle. 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 Good morning. Are you ready for a miracle? Because you're about to see one here at Unity of Daytona Beach here this morning. So again, welcome to Unity of Daytona Beach, a positive path for spiritual living. And yes, it's true, Unity of Daytona Beach has men. So it is a day of miracles. We have men that are going to be helping out with this service this morning. Can we get a woo, woo, woo? Yes. <laughs> And to start us off is our wonderful Jeff Ritter is going to share the daily word with us this morning. Hi, I'm Jeffrey. I'm a man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, today is uh, Sunday, June 20th, 2021. Uh, the daily word is Father's love. I give thanks for my father in all expressions of fatherly love. You want to say that with me, please? I, I give, give thanks, thanks for my father, father in and all, all expressions, expressions of, of fatherly, fatherly love. love. I treasure my childhood memories of feeling safe when my father or a father figure in my life was nearby. I remember my father's encouragement as I was learning to ride a bike, as we explored the wonders of nature together, and as he taught me to use money wisely. Even when I made youthful mistakes, my father's sometimes stern but always wise judgment helped me find the way back to my right path. I give thanks for both the sacred human and the unfolding expression of God within my father and everyone who has blessed me with fatherly love. Today I pray for my father and for all fathers, affirming for each of them growing wisdom, understanding, and willingness to nurture others with a father's encouraging love. And today's reading comes from uh, the Gospel of John, book 15, verse 9. As the father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. So, come on down. All right, well, please pray with me. We give, thank, uh, we give our thanks, Creator God, for the fathers in our lives. Fatherhood does not come with a manual. And reality teaches us that some fathers excel while others fail. We ask for your blessings for them all and forgiveness where it is needed. 
This Father's Day, we remember the many sacrifices fathers made for their children and families and the ways, both big and small, they lift children to achieve dreams thought beyond reach. So too, we remember all those who have helped fill the void when fathers passed early or were absent, grandfathers and uncles, brothers and cousins, teachers, pastors and coaches, and the women of our lives. For those who are fathers, we ask for wisdom and humility in the face of the task of parenting. Give them the strength to do well by their children and by you. So we are now in the presence of pure being and immersed in the Holy Spirit of life, love, and wisdom. We acknowledge your presence and power, O blessed Spirit. In your divine wisdom, erase our every human limitation, and from the pure substance of your love, bring into manifestation our world according to your perfect law. And because we align with and cooperate with that law, so it is. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, hallowed be thy name. Done on earth as it is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Give us this day our daily bread, hallowed be thy name. And forgive all our debts, hallowed be thy name. As we forgive our debtors, hallowed be thy name. Leave us not in temptation, hallowed be thy name. But deliver us from error, hallowed be thy name. Thine is the kingdom, the power and glory, hallowed be thy name. Forever and ever, hallowed be thy name. Amen, 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 hallowed be thy name. Amen, 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 amen. Hallowed be thy name. I am a promise. I am a promise, I am a possibility, I am a promise, I with a capital T. I am a great big bundle of potentiality, and I am learning to hear God's voice, and I'm trying to make the right choice. I am a promise to be anything I want me to be. I am a promise, I am a possibility, I am a promise, I with a capital P. I am a great big bundle of potentiality, and I am learning to hear God's voice, and I'm trying to make the right choice. I am a promise to be anything God wants me to be. I can go anywhere God wants me to go. I can be anything God wants me to be. I can climb the high mountains. I can swim the right sea. I'm a great big promise, you see. I am a promise. I am a possibility. I am a promise. I with a capital P. I am a great big bundle of potentiality. And I am learning to hear God's voice, and I'm trying to make the right choice. I am a promise to be 
anything God wants me to be. I am a promise to be anything God wants me to be. One great big bundle of potentiality. <laughs> That's what we are. All right, please join me in our statement of faith. There is only one presence and one power in the universe and in my life, God the good, omnipotent. Yes. And we have a few announcements. Oh, we do not. Is there anyone here for the very first time this morning? If we have any visitors or guests this morning, if you wouldn't mind just raising your hand, our ushers have a packet of information for you. Welcome. So happy that you're here and you chose to be with us this morning. May you feel the warmth that we have in our hearts for you already. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Just a moment. <laughs> I get by with a little help from my friends. <laughs> so we just wanted to let some of or all of you know that if you choose, one of our beloved members, Jeannie Lewis, is uh, having a health challenge. And our other beloved friend here, Miss Carol Evans, will be taking cards and things and well wishes, prayers to her thoughts. If you want to share this morning, Carol will be going to go visit her later this day. And so I just invite everyone to hold her in prayer and, and surround her in God's love and light. And know that wholeness is her true nature. Thank you. Now, let's see. Um, our chaplains are here after service. If you have a prayer request for them, starting um, this week, we will no longer be having the uh, prayer circle time on Zoom on um, Tuesdays at 4 because they're now back here in the sanctuary with us. That all got started when we were, um, you know, got shut down for the pandemic. So they will be here in the sanctuary if you have a prayer request for them. Also, too, always, if you're a member and you, you have a chaplain and you need a prayer request, you can always call in into the office and we'll get everybody in touch with each other for those needs, okay? And also, as well, we're still calling forth ushers. So we saw a new face here this morning ushering. I think we had some two, two newbies back there ushering for us today. Thank you for your service. Thank you for saying yes. So we're just in the process as we come back to in-person services, building our volunteer base back up. So please see Marianne Verna. Marianne, you're out there. There she is. Please see Marianne Verna if you're interested in ushering. It's, it's um, a great way to do service. It's a great way to meet people, and it really doesn't take too much of your time. So feel the nudge and see Marianne. <laughs> and then also, too, we're calling, calling all cars because there's a longtime member here of Unity of Daytona Beach that would love to be here with us, but he's no longer driving, and he needs a ride. So if there's anybody that lives, lives beachside, the Silver Beach area, and would be willing to give him a ride on Sunday mornings into church, please see uh, Jeannie or myself after service. Thank you. I think that's it. as Master Jesus taught us, be the love you are, shine the light you bear, shine the light you bear, just as Master Jesus taught us, shine the light you
Jesus taught us, sing the song you hear. Know the joy of life, know the joy of life, just as Master Jesus taught us, know the joy of life. The love you are, be the love you are, just as Master Jesus taught us, be the love you are, just as Master Jesus taught us, be the love. Join me now as we prepare to enter a time of silence. Take that time to quiet our thinking mind down just a little bit. To let go of the noise of the physical world. Everything that wants to call for our attention. So we make a choice in this time together this morning, and we just take a deep breath in together. Hold it for just a second, and then release that breath, that ah. It has been said that the voice of God is silent. And so that's what we prepare ourselves for in this time right now. We just continue to breathe. Take deep breaths in. Deep breaths out. No struggles. We don't try to force the mind to be quiet. This is just a time of allowing. We're just allowing. And as we become open, willing, and receptive to that one presence and that one power, Just allow spirit to have its perfect way with us just for a few moments. And so we breathe. And we release that breath. And just allow the quieting process. To begin. And throughout this time, just continue with your breath. The Gospel of John says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. Abide in my love. Take a breath in. Release that breath. What meaning, what feeling does abide in my love have for you? that fatherly love.
And so simply see yourself, feel yourself immersed, immersed, completely, fully. In the love of the Father. Divine love. Perfect love. Complete love. Take a deep breath in. Release that breath. And take the words, abide in my love, into the silence now. Take a deep breath in with me again. Release that breath. And I invite you as we move through this process here this morning just to continue to feel yourselves immersed in the love of the Father and giving thanks for all expressions of fatherly love. Take another breath in. Release that breath. And so it is. Amen. I lift up my hands, 
I lift up my voice to celebrate the goodness of God. We hear your voice in the silence, in the silence, a whisper sweet and clear. And it is then that we discover, we discover your presence ever near. Ours are the hands, ours is the voice to celebrate the goodness of God. If we lift up our hands, we lift up our voice to celebrate the goodness of God. To celebrate the goodness of God. To celebrate the goodness of God. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning once again. <laughs> It's Men's Day at Unity of Daytona Beach. <laughs> I have to say that as many times as possible today, you know. <laughs> so much appreciation for the divine masculine energy that's abounding, and it's always abounding here, but I'm just acknowledging it more so this morning. And so to bring this forth, I simply asked a few men here to participate. Now, there was no coercion. <laughs> there was no twisting of the arm. I simply helped them honor their spiritual nudge to share with us this morning. So you're welcome, Jeff, Des, Gary, Royce, Ken. You're welcome. See? <laughs> I'm so helpful that way. Oh, goodness. Well, indeed, happy Father's Day once again. And have you noticed that we humans put a label on just about everything? It's what the thinking mind does. You know, we cannot look at anything and not process it, right? And that's good news to some degree. <laughs> but what labels have we attached to Father's Day? And it can range the entire gamut, can't it? From excitement, celebration, anticipation to it's just another day, to let's try and avoid it entirely. <laughs> and that's not just for Father's Day. We, we have that around other things as well, but we're just focusing on this this morning. So I invite us today to come together as a spiritual family to celebrate fatherly love in all of its forms. You know, it's not in a box. The human mind wants to put it in a box, but in truth it is not. Sorry, I'm having this issue again today. Send me good energy. <laughs> but fatherly love is not limited to biological fathers, and it's also not limited to anyone who may have fulfilled that role as father on this earthly experience. Fatherly love, as expressed by our creator, is inclusive, unfailing, and readily available. My favorite scripture demonstrating this love is the parable of the prodigal son. It's a story of coming home. Jesus told the story to make a simple point, and I love this. Never mind what you have done, just come home. That message is for all of us. Never mind what you have done, just come home. Come home, come home to the truth with a capital T, come home to yourself, come home to the Father, and come home to divine love. Breathe with me. <sighs> that feels good to come home to all that, doesn't it? It did to me as I was preparing this lesson. 
And I believe that there are certainly times in our lives when we feel that we have lost our way, yes? And that to come home or to find home perhaps is nowhere to be found. As if our Google Maps got turned off. Or our Waze app is no longer working. <laughs> our cell phones will not give us directions. Now, this isn't for men, but women, and there's no one for, ask, for us to ask directions to, right? <laughs> men don't do that. <laughs> so they tell us, anyway. Or that we've lost our way on our path, right? So that we can't find that way home. Or that feeling of, I'm lost and I'm alone. But never mind what you have done, come home. And I invite us to come home to the truth. And it is that truth that we talk about and come together every single Sunday to remember that we are spiritual beings having a human experience and that we are inherently good. Let's all just say it together. I'm good. I'm good. Yes, you are. More than we all think, perhaps. And that at our core, we are indeed magnificent. Because once again, what is our true identity? It's that spiritual identity. That's the truth of us. That's part of what this capital T represents. That we have all been created in the image and likeness of God. That we are part of that God seed. That we are expressions of God. Each and every one of us unique in our own way. But nonetheless, all of us are expressions of God. And as we come home to this truth, any of those labels that we've attached ourselves to or that we have given others begins to decrease or at least have a little bit less of a hold on us at any rate, right? Less power to create limitations, limited thinking, limited beliefs about ourselves, so could you see that with me for just a minute? As we can rise up into the truth of who we really are and live from that place, from our spiritual identity, can we not see that thoughts of limitation, lack, dysfunction decrease? The more I know the truth of me, the less all those other limitations fall down by the wayside. Does that make sense? The bonus being, <coughs> excuse me, that we can begin to see the true relationships of ourselves and the truth of us and the truth of others. Which brings me to the reactions and the emotions that I have seen built around Father's Day. And maybe it's not just Father's Day at all. Maybe it was just a little more noticeable. But it's Mother's Day. It can be any other day we want to give a label to, right? Right? But I noticed it more around Father's Day, and I thought, what does this mean? What does this mean? And what am I supposed to do with that? And it's probably just all of the meanings that we've attached to it. So my dear buddy Martha Creek says that we are meaning-making machines. <laughs> Aren't we now? Yes, we are. <laughs> but the good news is that we have the power to change that if we choose. Because what? This day, we are just coming home. So take a breath with me. And then I'm going to thank you. Yes, me too. And so another favorite of mine is Father Richard Rohr. And he shares this a little bit on his shadow work. Meaning, and what is shadow work? Shadow work is those places in us that we want to repress or deny about ourselves. And we all have some of it, <laughs> and that's okay. It's part of this humanness experience that we're having. And these qualities that are placed in our shadow at times are not even necessarily bad, but they are simply some of the ones that are not rewarded by family systems or by culture or society as a whole. Now, he says, the more we have cultivated and protected a chosen persona, the more shadow work we will need to do. So think about it for just a second. What personas have we chosen? 
Therefore, we need to be especially careful of clinging to any idealized role or self-image like that of minister, mother, father, nice person, good person, professor, moral believer, or president of this, president of that, right? These are huge personas to live up to, and they trap many people in lifelong delusion that the role is who they are and who they are only allowed to be. The more we are attached to and unaware of such a protected self-image, the more the shadow self will likely have a hold on us. It's cause for another breath, isn't it? Our self-image is not substantial or lasting. It is simply created out of our own mind, desire, and choice. And wait for it. And everybody else's preferences about us as well. <laughs> and there's a few of those floating around out there, aren't there? He goes on further to say that the shadow work is necessary and creates an emergence of healthy, self-critical thinking. Now, when he talks about healthy, self-critical thinking, he means awareness, not criticism, which alone allows us to see beyond our own shadow and disguise to find who we are, hidden with Christ in God. Now, this really got me, this next part. He says the Zen masters call it the face we had before we were born. Think about that. I had to. That self cannot die. It lives forever, and it is our true self. The face we had before we were born. Take that in with me. Now, I would say to anchor our thoughts to this truth would certainly take some of the sting out of all of these expectations and labels that we've placed on ourselves and all others. Fathers, mothers, others, the list is ad infinitum, right? The face we had before we were born. Never mind what you think you have done, and I'm going to add, or that you think you have not done, just come home. It's like this endless love is just pouring forth to us and saying, come on, come back. Come back to me. Come back to the truth. Know who you are. From 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, and I will be father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. The face we had before we were born. And so as I was praying about this lesson and the enfoldment of it, I had just received my dear friend Martha Creek's book called Martha's Pearls. And we're going to post this later on in Facebook so you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But it's called, entitled Martha's Pearls, A Spiritual Approach to Life. And the page that I was reading on was entitled Transformation. She asks the question, what has to be transformed in us to awaken to the preciousness of what we have, what we are, and to stop taking anything for granted. She said when she uses the word transformation, she means a new way of seeing things. And I like that. I thought, well, isn't that exactly what happens when a transformation occurs? There's something that's opened up in us, in our consciousness, in our awareness, that enables us to see things in a new way. We're no longer stuck. So I thought, yes, perfect, a new way of seeing things, a new way of seeing ourselves, a new way of seeing any of those personas that we've attached to ourselves and others, any perceived roles, and a new way of looking at our shadows. Because believe it or not, those shadows have come to teach us. They've come to be our friend, too even though we don't want to think that, right? And some of my favorites always start with good. You know, the persona of a good dad, the persona of a good mom, a good child, a good dot, 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 right? <laughs> 
I had the persona forever as a good girl, be a good girl. That took years of therapy to get over. <laughs> True confessions, huh? St. Francis of Assisi said this. Hold on. We can patiently accept not being good. What we cannot bear is not being considered good, not appearing good. We like to look good, don't we? <laughs> it's all right. Of course we do. We can be honest here. One more limiting belief to let go of. And furthermore, I thought, what the heck is appearing good anyway? <laughs> it goes like this. Ask 10 different people. You'll get 10 different answers, won't you? At least. <laughs> well, here it comes, friends. As I'm working on all this, I had a flashback of my daughter in first grade. And I was homeroom mom. And I loved being there. That was my thing every Friday, all day long. Loved it, loved it. Now, you all know first graders are very, very busy, aren't they? They use up lots and lots of energy. And by the end of that school day, they start to get a little tired, don't they? Well, I see a school teacher over here nodding her head. <laughs> when my daughter was younger, she had the habit of sucking her ring finger when she was tired. So, yep, there we were, friends, in class. I'm the homeroom mom. I'm there, first grade. My daughter gets tired. In goes that finger. I'm in the room, and I'm over in the corner just dying, just dying. Because what am I saying? Because first of all, let me tell you, this whole story, I have her permission to share this with all of you, but let's be honest. This story is really about me, not so much about her, right? <laughs> Sad but true. But what was happening there? I had all this stuff centered around how that should or should not be, right? And the persona of this good mother, well, a good mother, daughter, wouldn't have to sit there and suck on her finger and soothe herself and have comfort over that now, should she? No. Not to mention, I'm in all my glory as a dental hygienist. And you know how bad that is for your teeth. Yep, right. I'm just like, I'm dying over here going, oh, please take that out of your mouth. Please take that out of your mouth. Please take that out of your mouth. No, she didn't. She, that, she continued to suck her finger till she got orthodontics. Yeah. <laughs> True. But what am I doing the whole time? I'm a bad mom. I'm a bad mom. Because my daughter doesn't feel, what, safe enough, secure enough, whatever the, all of the enoughs might be, that she has to suck her finger. Now, friends, aren't we just a whole comedy skit all of our own? Because how can it be that a six-year-old little girl over here sucking on her finger has anything to do with the adult woman standing over here? Sure, I gave birth to her, but that's beside the point. <laughs> but do you see what I'm saying? It was that whole direct correlation of how I had myself, my image of a good mom, all wrapped up in that behavior. It's a little bit of insanity, isn't it? <laughs> and so how do we think as humans that as fathers, mothers, and other names, grandparents, that if we do this, if I do this, it guarantees an outcome over here? Read on Job if you want to because that was one of my things. I thought, wait, if I do this, then that means that should happen. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. False believes waiting to be transformed. And that is just a, a tiny, tiny, small little example. But think about it. We've done that throughout our lives on little, in little places and on very much larger scales, haven't we? And isn't it time that we realize that this amazing life that we have said yes to is just our lives? It's just our lives. And whatever meaning that we have given to Father's Day or any other day of the year is self-imposed and possibly passed down from generation to generation of old belief systems that can be healthy 
and then sometimes not so much, right? But none of this type of thinking is spirit-led. It is not. Do we get caught up in believing that we are only acceptable to our creator, to the divine, if we are perfect? Perfect in this human condition? What an unattainable goal, yes? Friends, our Father, divine love, is big enough to handle it all. And newsflash, we are no surprise to God. <laughs> He's like, oh, there's no even a he, but spirit is not going, oh, can you believe it? Not once. This entire journey is a path to knowing our innate divinity and that it can have many twists and turns along the path. And it means nothing because we fall off and we get back on. We fall off, we get back on, right? But the path remains. And we are not here to suppress any part of our lives that we may want to perceive might be dark, less than pleasing, perhaps shadows. Friends, that is that very time. If there's any place in any of us, and there are, any place there, that is the time that we call for the, li for the light even more. Because you see, our Father's love is never absent. We separate ourselves from it, but it's never absent. And it is that very suppression, that hiding, that stuffing down, whatever it is that we think is unacceptable, that keeps us in turmoil, keeps us stuck in a cycle of dysfunction and a feeling of that separation from our God, separate from our Christ nature, which all equals what? More suffering. Father Richard Worth says this too, that the real message of Jesus is this from the Gospel of Matthew from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus talks of our Father in heaven who lets the sun shine on the good and on the bad, lets the rain fall on the just and the unjust alike. It is both the rain and the sun, not only the sun. And it is both the just and the unjust Jesus stresses that the fact that God obviously allows the interplay of shadow and light. God approves of it. And if God's perfection can allow for these tensions to work themselves out, who are we to insist on perfection in which all of those tensions must be suppressed? Take a breath. Did anybody's shoulders come down just a little bit? That there's plenty of room for the light and the dark, for the sunshine and the rain. Can we just say, thank you, God? Thank you, God. This means that it is only, this means it is not by what you do that you earn God's love. Not because you're so full of light and you've purged out any piece of darkness. No, 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 not at all. The fatherly love accepts you as you are. You belong to God. You belong to God. The Father embraces you, all of you. The light, the dark, the shadow, everything, everything. And it's already done. You don't have to wait on it. It's already been done. And just like the meaning of the parable of the prodigal son, Jesus wanted to demonstrate that regardless of outer conditions, how much rebellion may have occurred, that we are always welcomed home and that we have a continuous, unfailing love of the Father. Isn't it time that we stop suffering? You might want to say amen or yes. <laughs> Let's just stop it, right? Let's just stop it. So, what shadows might you consider this day to tend to, to have a little less fear around, to invite a little more light to, and to know that you will not be alone on your journey?
So take a breath in with me for, again for just a second. I'm going to invite you to close your eyes. Abide in my love and immediately know that you are immersed in the love of the Father and the love of God. And allow these words to be yours. The mind of God guides me. The life of God flows through me. The laws of God direct me. The power of God abides within me. The joy of God uplifts me. The strength of God renews me. Wherever I am, God is. Wherever I am, God is. Take a breath with me. Release that breath. And I invite you back with me. And now, dear ones, it is that time in our service where we have some special sharing from some of the men in our congregation. And I'm going to invite Des Whale to come up first, please. Good morning, everyone. Morning. I think most of you know me, but those of you that don't know me, I used to be a member of the choir that used to be positioned over there in the corner long before the pandemic days. Well, as you'll see by my last name, it's spelled W-A-L-E. There's no H in it, so there's nothing fishy about me. Okay? <laughs> when Reverend Teresa asked me to, if I could recall a, a particular Father's Day, I said yes, and my mind went back to 1989 when at that time I was living in Spain. A little closer? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was living in Spain at that time. I'd retired from the UK fire service uh, the year before, and my wife and I decided we wanted to live in a nice warm climate, so we moved to Spain. Well, at the same time, my only daughter, Lisa, she was studying at Sussex University in England, but part of that course on French and linguistics was for her to spend 10 months at the University of Caen down in the Normandy section of uh, France. And I got a message from her just prior to Father's Day that she would like to come up and spend Father's Day with us and bring her boyfriend, a French boy named Fred, which seems strange to me, but there we are. So anyway, we drove over to Valencia Railway Station, which was about 50 miles away from where I lived, and we, we met them at the railway station, brought them back home, went to bed that night nice and comfortably, and the following morning we got up and we had breakfast. Following breakfast, my daughter sidled up to me and said, uh, Dad, could you do me a favor? And I said, well, yeah. Well, she said, well, it's actually for Fred. I said, oh. She said, well, you probably know that he's not had a father in his life. His father left them when they, he was very small, so he said, no man to guide him on anything. And I was just wondering, I thought, oh my God, does she want me to tell him about the birds and bees? Or <laughs> what, what's, what's she going to ask me? So I said, yeah, well, what is it? She said, well, actually, he, he needs a shave. He's never shaved before. And nobody's shown him how to shave. Could you show him how to shave? And I said, wow, yeah, you sure, yeah. I, I'll show him how to shave. So later on in the day, I took him into the bathroom, gave him what he needed, safety razors and a can of sh uh, shaving foam, got him all foamed up and showed him how to stretch the skin with one hand and use the razor and pull funny faces when you go over your top lip and round by your ears. Even showed him how to deal with a little nick, a little piece of toilet paper, <laughs> <laughs> put, it, put it on the blood spot and leave it to dry. So anyway, got him all cleaned up and then I put some aftershave on his face and I told him that's, that's very good, makes the skin nice and smooth and the girls like it too. So, But you'll have to get your own, you're not having any of mine. So that evening we, we set off and we went to our favourite restaurant and we had a very nice meal together and sat and watched the flamenco dancers doing their, their stuff on the dance floor. Had a very nice Father's Day. The next day, my daughter and Fred, they set off for the next part of their journey which was to go down to Perpignan to visit his mother. 
that was my father's day in 1989. But every now and then when I look through the old photographs, I see a picture of Fred and I think that somewhere in this world there's a wife or a girlfriend that's enjoying the smooth, soft cheeks of a Frenchman <laughs> named Fred who learned to shave and was taught by an Englishman in Spain on Father's Day. Thank you. When Teresa asked me to do this, I didn't know I was going to have to follow a professional English uh, comedian, humorist, <laughs> or a, a, an outstanding amateur anyway. So, you know, I know from experience, uh, both personal and from being in a lot of churches, that Father's Day can be a little dicey. Uh, Teresa started out talking about that. Now, I've been both a son and the father. So I know it's impossible to hit the ball out of the park every time. You just hope that you don't go 0 for 4 and strike out each time. My father, my father was probably the most selfless person I've ever known in my life. Nothing was ever about him. He was a family man through and through. Nurturing, always good humored, he had simple values, and you could count on him to stick to them. He was a, a blue-collar guy in Detroit, where I'm from, and he was born and raised as well. Uh, he was a machinist in auto manufacturing, what they called the skilled trades. The only white shirts he ever wore to work were the ones that said, Fruit of the Loom, and came three to a pack. He would never say no to overtime, extra days, Saturdays, Sundays even, when they needed them. He always had, among his seven kids, someone who needed a new pair of shoes. And where he worked was cold in the winter, hot in the summer, noisy and dirty. He wasn't about his work. He was about his family. And when he wasn't working, he was coaching. He coached youth sports until he was probably close to 60. And I would say that probably his greatest legacy is that he had unconditional love for his children and that it's returned to him and that there's a lot of grown men out there who still call him coach, even though he passed almost three years ago. So how could a guy like me who was privileged to have such a giving father have had any issues with him? Well, yeah, <laughs> we, we, we got some support from here. You know, see, you needed him to say amen before. <laughs> yeah, uh, some of you might know, a few of you anyway, that uh, one of the things that I'm associated with is the Julia Cameron program called The Artist's Way, a spiritual path to higher creativity. And one of the things that we do in that class is that we try to identify the brambles, both dead and alive, that surround us and keep us from fully recovering or discovering or recovering our creative selves. It's a little bit of an exercise like Teresa preached about a couple of weeks ago about the young man whose teacher was a dream stealer who dreamed of having a horse farm and she told him to get off his high horse and not have such big dreams. Well, we try to do that because even though we know that uh, it's not really somebody else's responsibility, those kind of perceptions that are worked into us can have a real effect on us and they take work to get rid of. Now, when we got to that part, when I was first a student in the class, we were asked to identify our Hall of Fame of inhibitors, and I wrote in big capital letters with an exclamation point, my father. Now, if you would have asked my father when I was growing up, who can be an artist, who can be a creative, he would have scratched his head not really understanding the question and maybe volunteered somebody else's children. 
Now, he, all, he wanted us all to rise above where he was in life, but his anticipation was we'd be engineers or we'd be in some kind of technical field. Uh, which is what all my brothers ended up doing, by the way. I was the one literary one in, in the group. Well, as years went by, and I led the Artist's Way program, every time I got to that part in the book, and I would see my father's name there, it would be getting a little fainter, like it had been written with disappearing ink. And it was partly that I was learning the path that I was on with the artist's way, but also that I was knocking and seeking a great deal in my spiritual life in general. So it finally came to pass that when I looked at it, I said, yeah, yeah, I remember why I first wrote it, but it holds no power over me anymore. I had come to understand that there's only one person that really could stand in the way of be, me being the creative that I was supposed to be, and that was me. And that God's promise was sure that anything I set my heart on was already mine. Well, it was about that time when I had fully come to that realization that I published my novel. And my father, who generally limited his reading to Zane Gray Westerns, ordered a copy of my novel, and he read it. And I went to Detroit, I was in here in Florida, and I went to Detroit where we're from for a visit. And when I got there, he kind of sheepishly came up to me and said, can I talk to you for a minute? And I said, sure, Dad. He said, first of all, I want to tell you I read your novel and I really enjoyed it. And I also wanted to say, I'm sorry. I said, um, I said sorry for what? He said, you know, your mother and I, we're simple people. Neither of us got past high school. I didn't really understand who you were when you were growing up. And I said to him, Dad, I know you always did the best you could, and your love always came through. And from that moment on till the day he passed, there was a sweetness in our relationship that hadn't been there before. I appreciated it. He appreciated it. We had both grown immensely in the spirit, and happiness was ours together. Thank you. Uh, glad I don't have to follow them. My story will be a little different. <laughs> when Reverend Teresa asked me <laughs> to share today about my experience of being a father, I was hesitant and anxious. There's a sense of vulnerability that I needed to overcome. Sharing my story has always been difficult for me. But it is good to have a home. It is good to have a place where you can feel safe. <clears throat> Here are some of my shadows. <laughs> uh, as a father of two beautiful, intelligent, and sometimes kind young ladies, I felt too close to certain recent events to discuss me as a father. So instead, I'd like to introduce you to the one who served as my dad in order to acknowledge and thank that individual today. I've never shared or told this individual what I'm going to say today. I was born into this world on August 29, 1966, unto an unwed mother with two children from a previously failed relationship. My father was a bright, hardworking, angry, abusive alcoholic who physically abused my mom and my siblings. To escape my father, my mom moved us in secret to Florida in 1972. From 1972 until today, the only male influence around me was my older brother. His name is Craig Columbus Morris, and I love him. 
I had imagined that I'd stand up here today and wax poetically about my love for him. But as time grew closer to put pen to paper, it became clear that the person who deserved the most credit to be honored today, the one who taught me the necessary life skills, who was both easy and hard on me at the correct times, and who's still the first person I call when I'm unsure. The one that I'm honoring today is my sister, Selena Sakota Morris. I love her and I thank her for everything she has taught me that's made me a better dad. I don't come from a traditional family and I wasn't given a traditional role model as a dad. And today I can say, thank you, God. So if you struggle with memories of a father or the duties of being a father, I pray that you too can release those feelings today and start working on new ones. God bless. August 16th, 1974, 4.30 a.m., my son was born. Now, for many fathers, they would probably be taking a sigh of relief at that time because the nine-month journey was over, okay, and the child was in the world, the child was safe, but this wasn't me, okay? Now, don't get me wrong. I was happy that my son was, was safe and in the world, but I got to be truthful with, with you folks. I was very terrified. I was terrified. Here, you know, a 22-year-old young man having the responsibility of a little child. I mean, what was I supposed to do? What was I supposed to think? What was I supposed to know? I didn't have any examples, any role models, or anyone that I can call, you know, or, or say was a father figure for me. So I was very scared. Now, my own father was a good man. He was a very loving man. Um, but he had his own issues. He had a, a lot of his own issues that I'm not going to go into this morning. But he served in World War II, and he also lived for most of his life in the South, and let me add a racially divided South as a black male, okay? So with those two things and other things combined, I couldn't really see him as the ideal role model for me as a father. But let me say about my father, I admire him. I admire him greatly for the inner strength that he has. I admire him for his determination to see that his family had a good life, a better life. In fact, shortly after leaving the war, he and my mom decided to migrate from the South, from this area of the South, uh, to New York to make a better life for my brothers and myself. So for that, in fact, let me say this, if it wasn't for that move, I am certain I would, would not be here speaking to you today, okay? But let me say this, I, I, I say to you, Dad, I'm speaking to you, Dad, and say for that move and for all the many other gifts that you've given me in my life, I just am so grateful and I love you and I thank you. Now, as, as a young father, I can truly say that at, at one point, I really felt the hand of God and the arms of the angels around me. Because in 1981, just seven years after my son was born, I walked into the doors of this Unity Church, okay? It was a lot different at that time. It was only about half the size, but the love, and it matched the love that we have today. It was equal love, and I felt like I was at home. And I immediately began to dive into the unity teachings and the unity concepts. I was so happy I felt like I was home, really. And what I quickly discovered was that um, a, major, a major learning was that that love and light of God lies at the core of our being, more specifically at the core of my being. And because of that learning, it's like 
I realized that I didn't need all the props. I didn't need all the examples and the role models and the father figures. Now, if you have those things in, in, in one's life, that's really a bonus. But all we really need to get by and to be successful is knowing, finding out about that special God place inside and really working from that, and everything turns out okay. Throughout the 40 years that I've been associated with um, unity and new thought, I have had uh, uh, created so many beautiful relationships and friendships with so many people, hundreds and hundreds, maybe even over a thousand people. And with all that love and support and caring and, and belief in me, I know that I have become a better person, a better friend, a better father, a better grandfather, and wait for it, now even a better great-grandfather, okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, so I'd just like to say, you know, in love and gratitude and appreciation, I'm so thankful for all of you, and I say thank you. In just a moment, I'll be sharing um, a song called Sacred Love. I'm sorry, Quiet Love. Okay, quiet, quiet love, okay, <laughs> quiet love, okay, and I'm going to dedicate this song to all the fathers in the room and also those that are listening online. Now, I'm going to ask that as you listen to this song, as you watch the uh, beautiful slides that Jeannie so graciously prepared for us, I'm going to ask that you not just watch these things or listen to the, the words of the song, I'm going to ask you to have an experience with the song. We started today with a song, My Day for a Miracle. Folks, today can be your day for a miracle if you can just in a few seconds see your father in a different light. Okay, if you can put aside all of the things, all of the experiences, good, bad, and different that you've had about him, all the judgments that you held about him, if you can just put those things aside. Now, you can pick them up later if you want, you know, before you leave, but I'm going to invite you to just set them aside for a little bit and only see that beautiful, perfect God light within him. And if it's just for a few seconds, a miracle could be waiting for you. So I'm going to invite you to do that. And you can do this whether your father is um, alive today or whether he has made his transition. It doesn't really matter, okay, because the Spirit of God lives within us always and forever. So, quiet love. You're the man who celebrates my birth Half the reason I'm on earth But somehow you were hidden in the shadows I spent half a lifetime at arm's length Saw weakness in your quiet strength But love has finally opened up my eyes It's so good to see you really see you at long last. I treasure every moment now and the going by so fast. Years of longing for a father and you've already existed. Yours is such a quiet love. I almost missed it. My friends had more exciting dads. There were doctors, lawyers, college grads. While you were selling tires down on Main Street. Somehow I didn't understand the caring in your callous hands. The perfect love that waits inside your heart. It's so good to see you, really see you long last I treasure every moment now and go 
growing by so fast. Years of longing for a father, and you already existed. Yours is such a quiet love. I almost missed it. All the years I was wishing, Father knows best. You were loving me so much better. And all the tears that's been wasted, lost in regret, has turned into something so tender. It's so good to see you, really see you at long last. I treasure every moment now, going by so fast. Years of longing for a father, and you already existed. Yours is such a quiet love. I almost missed it. Yours is such a quiet love. I almost missed it. I also just want to take a minute before we move on here to thank each and every person, all of our men today that shared authentically from their heart, with their humor, with their love. We thank you. We thank you. You blessed us richly. You blessed us richly, and I say thank you. Okay, friends, it's that time we share our gifts and our tithes. So in whatever way you've already shared that, whether you've placed it in the basket back there today or you're giving online, let's infuse it with fatherly love. Right now, if you just hold that in consciousness with me, we infuse it with fatherly love and send it out into the world to create more of that fatherly love here on planet Earth. And so it is. And our affirmation of abundance, please. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, God, and it is so. Yes. Thank you both. Good to go. And again, let's just give one more, throw in a little more gratitude one more time with me. Let's just say thank you, God, together. Ready? Thank you, God. And it is so. It is so. Now it's time for our prayer for protection. Join me, please. The light of God surrounds us. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. The presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is and all is well. To read. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant. Walk with each other in perfect harmony. Let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my solemn vow. To take each moment and live each moment in peace. 